Live from Miami Beach, Florida, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering .next Conference, brought to you by Nutanix. Now your host, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Okay, we're back here at .next, the conference, the Nutanix Conference, first ever Nutanix Conference at the Fontainebleau Hotel in Miami. Is that how you say it, Fontainebleau? It's spelled like Fontainebleau. I don't know, yeah, Fontainebleau. Dave, you can do the and, uh, Italian, you can do the French, uh, you know. It's a fantastic show, just under a thousand people here in the inaugural conference, a lot of energy, a lot of clapping in the audience today. Bob Love is here, he's a, the director of IT at Bottom Line, Boston-based. Good to see you, Bob, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for having me, guys. So, you're getting your weekends back. You got time to watch the Pats. That's right. That's right. Uh, tell us about that story. Where did that originate? Or the the uh, Inflate Gate. Is that what you're referring <laughs> no, to? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Please, we're Patriots go, fans yeah. all here. So <laughs> let, let's, let's change that subject back to. We didn't know. do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, part of uh, part of the reason why I get my weekends back is because of the most disruptive and liberating technology that I've used in the last ten years, and that's the Nutanix platform. Uh, it's it's a it's a technology that has given me high availability back and ease of management, and for me and my teams, that we can actually take machines in and out of the clusters, we can perform maintenance on them at any time of the day or night, and we choose to do that during the day, by the way, so that we can go back and have our weekends and enjoy our families, which is, which is a much more pleasurable experience than being in and patching systems. So tell us about Bottom Line. What's the, what's the company about, and what, what, what's, the, what's their sure. story? Sure, so Bottom Line is a, uh, a financial services focused SaaS provider. So we're a software as a service organization. We provide websites and banking uh, locations for uh, uh, about 800 banks and uh, credit unions. We do uh, payment networks for online payment systems. So if you join our ecosystem, you can have automatic payments sent to your vendors. It's, uh, uh, there's a variety of other services that they provide through corporate systems uh, for legal and healthcare as well. So we're, we're spread across uh, a wide variety of the industries, but mo the primary focus is in financial systems. And now we're starting to spend a lot of time and energy doing uh, security work for those companies as well. How many well. people are you? We're a 1,500 person organization, and we're actually based out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, not out of Boston, by the way. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Tech, tech companies in Portsmouth, that's yeah. right over the border. But, uh, okay, so, so you're essentially building your own IT infrastructure as a service, you're providing Correct. that, so you're a service provider. So tell us about the, the infrastructure, what's the plumbing look like? Sure, sure, so today we have two primary data centers in the United States and we have uh, two others in the UK and in, in uh, other parts of, in Geneva. Um, we're, for the most part, hosting all of our customer infrastructure there. Uh, we also have a significant footprint in IT and our corporate services, like for all of our back-end things that we do that keep the company running, like email and link and instant messenger and video conferencing. And those are the areas that I've actually started to focus in on and using Nutanix technology to try and uh, stabilize and grow. Now, now, how long you been at Bottom Line? I've been there for three years. Okay, so. When did you bring Nutanix in? Did, did you oversee that? Or? Yes, I did. So, okay, the, the, so, exactly. so give us the before and after. Tell us the... Sure, uh, the, the first use of the technology was with the DDI. It was uh, our virtual desktop infrastructure where we were delivering desktops to all of our developers who are located all around the world. So it was a great technology to be able to send them the entire desktop to do their work on in a secure fashion. And Nutanix gave us the ability to do that in a very scale out fashion. We were able to, the workload for that virtual infrastructure was a nice fit. And that was our first sort of putting our toes in the water for Nutanix. It worked out great, so then we've now taken it and we've grown it to all of our core back-end IT yeah. infrastructure. Can, can I ask Bob, you know, when, when you decided in Nutanix, you know, who else were you looking at? What were you know, some of the decision criteria there? That, sure, well, you know, we looked at our brownfield build out that we have today. We're, we're a company that's been around for about 20 years. So we've, a portion of our, our organization is based on growth, is based on mergers and acquisitions, or we like to call them combinations. Those combinations that we do can pick up a, a wide variety of infrastructure from other organizations. And we like to standardize on things, and we need to do it in a very rapid fashion. So, it actually, you don't know what you're going to get when you're actually walking into a, a situation like that. So it could be a variety of infrastructure. So what we like to do is come in, and we come in fast, and we use these devices to, to, to blend a standard across all of our sites. And 
ag again, in our back-end corporate infrastructure, we got legacy products like uh, you know, enterprise arrays from EMC, uh, NetApps, you name it. We have just about every storage array known to, uh, to man, and we've, we're basically trying to standardize and, and consolidate down to one vendor, and that is no So chance. we'd love to talk to the practitioners so we can get the, the real story, and, and the, one of the challenges that I think people have, one of the one of the things the industry does that's, that's not good, the vendor community, is they will take a brand new shiny product and they'll compare it to a you know, five-year-old, 10-year-old architecture and say, yeah. we doubled performance. Well, you damn well better double performance if it's been that long. So, right. so I'm trying to peel through, squint through, and, and figure out, Bob, how much of what Nutanix, relative to what you had before, is sort of the architecture, the newness, all the things that we're hearing about today, and how much is it that you just had older products being replaced by newer products. What's really different? I, I, it's definitely, we're, we're a very con cost conscious organization and the operational ex money that it takes to run a data center that has 50 racks of servers that require cooling and electrical and, and security around that is, is, is a significant number. When I can take that and a brownfield build out like that and I can bring it down to like four, four racks and I can pick those up and move them around anywhere in the world, then I've just made us a more efficient and agile organization, and that that's a significant hit to the bottom line for us. So no no do, pun intended. When you do, yeah, well, <laughs> talking to your CFO, when you do a business case, <laughs> so it's it's relatively straightforward, I would think, to make a business case of, look, here's what we're doing today. Yeah. If we do this, yeah. we can save a bunch of dough, consolidation, yeah. cut power and cooling. And I presume the CFO is going to say, fine. Yeah. I'll leave the technology decision to you, Bob. You figure out which technology best, which vendor, that's fine. I'll write the check if you're going to guarantee or you know commit to saving that money. Fine. Right. When you, as an IT practitioner, make that decision, I presume you look at a like-to-like -like comparison. What I'm yep. saying is you look at new products versus new products, not new products versus old products. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could sort of take us inside, you don't have to name names, but if you want to, that's great. In terms of when you were doing the comparison three right. years ago, what sure. did you see so that attracted it, you to Nutanix? Uh, it's a great question. And, and, and Nutanix was the most attractive of all of them when I looked across the, the, the spectrum of providers in this space because they were actually the owners of the tin, or the hardware as well as the software that sits on top of it. They were fully integrated and they were consolidated. When I looked at some of the other vendors, I mean you could look at EMC, you could look at uh, VBlock for example, or some of the other uh, providers that have similar alternative solutions. What they are is really just sort of, uh, they're playing catch up with this organization because they built it from the ground up. And the way they did it was Unlike anybody else, where they blended the SSDs with your, you know, traditional S slower drives, your SATA disks, so that they had a great story for that performance requirement that is always hitting my, my, the top of my request from my desk, is that everybody needs performance, but they don't need it all the time and they don't need it every day. But when they need it, they need to know it's going to be there. The Nutanix platform was the only one that could guarantee it all in one block. So. And, it was a great story. So it was the integration. Yeah. Um, you talked about your availability improving. We heard the Gartner guy this morning say yeah. that what, forty percent of the, you know, unplanned outages are due to human error, and the other Correct. forty percent are due to co coding. 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 Yeah. So Eighty percent is human, right? So, don't make changes is the message there. But you got to make changes to stay Correct. competitive. So is that really where you got the availability hit? Yeah, it was it was part of it. Uh, the the Nutanix story when they simplify the stack when I take out four or five different vendors that I have to worry about vulnerability patches, things of that, and all that complexity goes away, then my, then my SLAs go up and my uptime goes up because I'm able to uh, achieve a, a simpler organizational approach to the way I manage that. Yeah. So that I take the human factor out of it. Yeah, gosh, Bob, you bring up a you know hugely important point is you know the yeah. upgrades and the migrations. You know, yeah. uh, at Wikibon we say that you know conservatively speaking, you spend over thirty percent of the budget of storage over the lifetime of it yeah. by just doing those migrations, moving stuff in, moving it out. They said that's you know storage admins. That seems to be what they spend a lot of their time on. They do. Um, and the patching, I mean, patching's so difficult. And when do you do it? How do you do it? Um, you know, what, what's the Nutanix uh, environment like? Is it truly, you know, just a pool of infrastructure, you add, move, change, you know, yeah. always upgraded, you know, much more, uh, you know, seamless? So, y they'll, they'll, talk, they'll tell you the story about the one-click upgrade. Yeah. We've been through three of them now, and it actually is that simple. So, I'm, I'm very happy with what they've done, and, and they continue to improve it. And some of the road mapping that they're sharing about increasing the performance and the high availability, 
is going to get even better. So it, it, I think what it does is it frees up my guys to do higher tasks now. Yeah. They're no longer running around worrying about you know vulnerability patches at the switching layer or something like that. They're actually thinking about automation and, and orchestration, which is going to save us even more cost efficiencies down the road. Yeah, so, the, you know, huge point there. Some people are worried that, you know, you make some change, oh, I'm going to fire my staff or, you know, bring in new people or just, mm -hmm. you know, the only thing that matters is the virtualization admin and everything goes. It sounds like you've, you know, just moved some things around and adjusted and, and added more value back to the business. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's so that we're, we're the, 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 the same people, the same very bright people that I like to work with are all doing different things too. And it's, and it's a wonderful experience for all of us. Yes. So, so go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just, you know, one of the things that we say is really tough on IT is you never get rid of everything. So um, there was a quote in the morning video. I mean, you, you were quoted in in uh, in the keynote for uh, you know getting your weekends back. But there was a customer that said, you know, raid groups, you know, configuring raid groups is like dead. I yes. got rid of it. What tasks did you get rid of? I mean, do you have you gone back to your you know management and said like you know here's all the things we've done better and here's all the things we're doing? How are you a hero internally sure. now that you do Nutanix? Sure, it, it, I, it started with like I had mentioned early on is the high availability and being able to take my critical systems like my email systems. I can take them out of an N plus one model. I can work on it during normal regular business hours during the day. I can patch it and push it back into the cluster all without affecting the flow and mail and the services, those key services that help the, the company grow. And that's how I've become a hero, because prior to the Nutanix platform being there, things were done the old-fashioned way. It was, a, it was a legacy architecture that required, you know, those six or seven different vendors all had to be addressed on an individual basis. And we're in the financial space, so we have very strict change control. And we have very limited windows of time in which we're supposed to be able to take things offline. And we have to coordinate that with our customers, which is very important. So now we we've taken that all of that and we made it irrelevant with the uh, with the high availability model. So you would normally do a major software when you do a major software upgrade. Typically, best practice would be to shut down, right? Is that correct? In the old days, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. the old days weren't that long ago. Yeah, right? it's true. true. <laughs> and there were some vendors that would do things to allow you to sort of you know upgrade on the fly, but. It was a dangerous business, and one that was was not recommended. So you're saying that's now your standard practice. Yeah, and, and, and it has to do with this platform, mostly, because we've been able to take that to the next level of SLAs and high availabilities, and we can even, we can stand behind them with confidence, whereas before it was, it was not always that confidence wasn't there that we could keep those services up and running at right. a four nines up time. Now you're a VMware shop, right? Correct. Um, so what do you make of this? Stu and I have been talking today mm -hmm. about it's even VMware, awesome company. We, they're just you know phenomenal ecosystem. But as they get bigger, you know other people try to come into their space. They're going into other people's spaces. They're being very careful about where they go and yeah. very, very prescriptive. It feels like Nutanix is saying, "Damn the torpedoes! We want to go multi-cloud. We want to make storage invisible. We want to make virtualization invisible." Yes. So it's interesting, a little friction there. But what do you make of that as a as a customer? What do you what do you want to see from VMware and Nutanix? So I, I think that friction that you're describing is going to be good for the customer. It's going to be good for bottom line. It's going to be good for all of us who are consumers of those resources. Because that that competition breeds best of breed. It'll breed what we think is going to be a better hypervisor. Uh, it'll make VMware stand up and take notice. It's going to make them. Uh, hopefully maybe uh, be a little more cost effective in what they do for the licensing perspective of their tools. Um, when it comes right down to it though, I, I ask my guys and, and myself, you know, I, if I compare what are the key features of their software that we use every day from VMware, and I say, you know, can we get it from an alternative hypervisor? And the answer is yes. So, you know, why pay that VMware tax when you don't have to? It's a, it's a really legitimate business question. Are you using the Nutanix? Hypervisor? Or? We have not started yet. Acropolis, but you know, with the announcement that we're hearing this weekend is, is very exciting. But you, you're, you're interested, you're leaning. Very, very you're you're going to find out more. Very, yeah, very, I've already, we're taking some really close looks at it for some, some very specific business uses. So you essentially don't want to pay for function that you can, you, sh you think you should get it for free. You're, you're happy to pay up the stack for value, but is that, that's correct. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's, it, it's pretty common sense. I think that's you know one of those things that my father taught me back in the day. <laughs> See, if, if, if you can get it, for half the price, and well, I buy the cow if the milk is free. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. What else is going on? How about how about cloud in your world? Uh, public cloud, specifically using public cloud. I mean, you are a public cloud provider. So yeah, we're 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 more of a private cloud subscriber for our for our customers. Yeah. Um, 
data privacy is a big challenge for us in this space, especially in the financial world. You know, we have a lot of sensitive information, you know, bank account information, you name it. So public cloud's a swear word? So <laughs> it, it's not, it's not. It's actually something that I think eventually will be a part of our, our future. But um, until we can get there in a very secure and strategic fashion, we're going to take our time. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Bob, uh, we, we've been talking about kind of the ecosystem building out here, and there, there's one you know, new company, uh, Rubrik, uh, that you, you've, got, you've uh, looked at some, uh, test now. Tell, tell us a little bit about what, what brought you to Rubrik and uh, sure. why you're looking at them. Sure, uh, Rubrik is a very interesting company. I mean, it, it caught my eye when we first looked at it because it had the similar story of hyperconverged and simplicity and ease of use, and it took a lot of the, the science project out of a backup story. Our enterprise backup solutions, just like our computing solutions before we started implementing Nutanix, had a lot of complexity. They had storage networks, they had targets, they had media agents, you had software licensing, and you needed an army of people to run it. And it took you months to stand it up and get a good backup of that environment. Now the Rupik story is new, they're hyper-converged, it looks a lot like the Nutanix story, and if it works out, and if they can mature, and they can give us those feature functionalities that I'm hoping that they can deliver on, I think that they could be a really viable backup solution for us. So, we were talk talking offline a little bit. What's interesting, I, I think I told you, I've been writing about this for years and years and years, David Ploy and myself, the time machine for the enterprise, that's kind of what they're, they're all about. That's a great analogy. And, 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 yeah. and is there a synergy with Nutanix, or is it just sort of birds of a feather in this modern world? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I know that I've heard some Nutanix, you know, is this a space that they want to get into? Could it be? I mean, it seems like it would be a logical play for them as well. Um, but they, the, the blending of these two technologies together, I think it's, they're filling a gap right now in, from, from a product roadmap standpoint that they don't have. So I think that's where Rupik is a very attractive piece for us. So when you think of your Clouds. Am I right? You essentially have one it's, cloud. Yeah. Right. It's it's a it's a private cloud. It's your but private yeah, it's a cloud, cloud, and you don't have multiple private clouds that you're trying to sort of manage, or or do you? Yeah. I, I get. We have different clouds for different audiences. So, and it okay. all depends on. Uh, we we have segmentation requirements that keep our corporate infrastructure needs to be very different and separate from our customer facing stuff. So, so this idea of being able to move between clouds, is that attractive to you? Absolutely. And how often do you actually do something like that? So, some of the, some of the information that we learned about Acropolis this, these last few days uh, are going to be very attractive for us to be able to take You would do it job. more if you yes. have that capability. Yeah, Why, what's the motivation for, for moving those workloads? Bottom line's actually a big Microsoft partner. We're actually a gold partner with their development team. So. We do, a lot of our customers run a lot of their software. So if we're able to integrate, and, they're, and they're, a lot of them are starting to go to their cloud, whether mm -hmm. it be Azure or Amazon. Um, so if we can do better and tighter integration work with those products, and it means going to the cloud to get that testing and that work done, then we'll be going there. It'll just, it won't be all in the same sort of VLAN segmentation. We'll have to make sure that we have it properly organized. So, so Bob, I'm curious, has the container discussion come up in your workplace yet? Are you playing with it, doing anything with it, or is it out in the future? Yeah, it's out in the future for us right now, yeah. What else excites you today? Like this, the number of announcements, um, the, the, the erasure coding, uh, what'd you make of that? It's going to be a great performance uptick. Um, the, I, I, I really, you're looking at it from a performance yeah, standpoint. Yeah, I, I, I don't it understand. It, they're, they're, gonna, they're, they're gonna connect it, their resource mapping and the, what they're doing there to achieve some of the technology. I, I attended one of their key sessions today. It was fascinating. One of the, their engineers are, have got a way to optimize that file system in a way that I think we're only just beginning to see. So I think the performance is going to go north from here. So it's not a typical object store uh, type of approach that you'd see. It's yeah, it's uh, it is not that yeah. I, no yeah. not that what I learned today. And, and yeah, that's me too. <laughs> and, and and right, it's new. We just heard about it this morning. And the f and the file system, the native native file system. What does that mean to you? The, the distributed file system. The, well, the, the, the essentially the the file based as opposed to block based. You know, native going after NetApp. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it's a great play, and and uh, we would love to take advantage of it in our BDI infrastructure that I mentioned to you earlier. You, that you know, being able to prevent uh, present to those users a home folder, which would be great. Today we don't do that. We're all all of our VMs that we're presenting and sending to all of our users around the world are, uh, they're thin and they're not with any home folders, but that would be a great feature to be able to have yeah. and be more persistent. 
So, so Bob, give us a little insight as to you know your activity here at the show. Have you been hitting the session? You doing small meetings? Yeah. You know, how's the technical content here? You, you've been to VMworld in the past. You know, how, how's this uh, the, you know line up? It's it, this is uh, one of the best trade shows I've been to. Actually, it's 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 quite impressive, uh, and for the, their their first one, their first big one like mm -hmm. this, it's really I'm very impressed. So um, it, it I think it shapes up or it it uh, it compares very well with some of those other big ones that I've been to. Great, is that and, I mean, you know, just the, the breadth of content, yeah, the, the the access I, to the I've engineers? Been what's the some of the some of the sessions that I've attended today have been extremely informative. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the engineers who were presenting are, are, are impressive. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Josh Hodges who's from Australia. Yep, yep. He's actually one of the architects that helped me put together our exchange on-premise platform on Nutanix and we're running that globally. Uh, I was able to actually do a little bit of a, a co-production with him today to talk to other customers about putting their email systems on that. Just Can I go back to my uh, product discussion? <laughs> <laughs> if you must, sure. Uh, I know, am I boring you? I just love to get the practitioners you know, feel for this. So you yep. in the audience today, you see the keynotes? Did you, did you catch the keynote? I did, no? yes. So the loudest clap was when um, the, the person who was doing the demo, I forget his name. I think Korean. it was Benny, was it Benny? Maybe? Was it Benny, no, uh, was it Benny who was doing the demo? Yeah, yeah the, the, okay. and the containers when and Benny stuff, yeah. created 100 VMs. Yeah. yeah. Like that. Yeah. That, were you clapping? I was. Well, so I was like, me. did he really just do that? So tell <laughs> me, we'll talk about why that excited you so much. Well, um, it, it, uh, 100 VMs, that's, that's the automation and orchestration piece that I mentioned earlier, that's the higher function that I need to get my team to. And today we're running around patching switches and we're working on updating Windows machines with you know, the latest security updates. Those are the things that they're not getting to that could add more value to our company and make us more agile and efficient. And he's doing it one person with a click of a mouse for 100 VMs. That's fascinating to me. What'd you think of the UI? It's very, it was beautiful. And, the, and the, uh, one of the things I've heard this weekend is simple is genius. And it yeah. is, that is a simple and, and, and elegant interface. And will you use, you're using Flash, obviously. Yep. How are you using Flash? Uh, so we're actually sort of, they have a unit called a 9000 series unit that's an all Flash array. And we're looking closely at that as one of our potential solutions to help us with a, a real big database issue that we're challenged with. So, uh, but we're also using all of the, uh, the smaller flash arrays in, in the SSDs, obviously, inside of all of the other Just blocks. For hot data, kind of thing. Yeah. One of the things that we've found with talking to practitioners in the Wikibon community is that they're basically taking space efficient snaps and then they're data sharing. So in conventional disk, you got to have multiple copies and you need multiple spinning disks to support them because of the performance issues. Yeah. With flash, what people are doing is they're sharing this, this, you know, the same infrastructure, multiple copies. Live data, essentially. Yeah. So the developers are working on fresh data. Is that something that you could see as adding value to your organization? Does that make sense to you? I guess it's going to depend on the use case for bottom line. I could see it in some cases. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if there's a, a, a large footprint for it yet. How do you service developers today? I mean, what's your DevOps situation? Maybe talk about that a little bit. Sure, sure. It, it, today it is, you know, uh, as I mentioned, VDI is one of those places that we deliver virtual infrastructure to our developers around the world. Um, they also request VMs on a, on a you know, moment to moment basis. So being able to respond to those in, a, in a, uh, an agile and automated fashion, and even in a self-served fashion in the, in the, is my end goal, really, is to be able to give them the ability to go in and spin up and use the CRUD to be able to turn on and destroy their own VMs when they're finished with them, and return that compute and storage back into the repository. I'm sorry, Bob, I just uh, thought, thought of something. I'm just curious, are there any environments that Nutanix doesn't fit in your environment today? If I look across the organization, across all of the businesses and all of the core services that we're supporting, mm -hmm. I can't find one. Can't find one because they are, they're agnostic about their approach in doing, whether it be the hypervisor or the storage or any of the underlying infrastructure. Uh, it, it, it's a good fit for everything that we do. What's on their to-do list? What do you want to see from them? Mm. I want to see site-to-site uh, -site replication over a wide area network. And I need them to, uh, to, to bring down the millisecond response time. That it's, they, they, ha they currently have a step in that right direction on their roadmap, um, but I think they need to go, uh, when they can get it to the point where I can replicate my data all the way across the oceans, then I'm all in. How are you doing that today? Uh, we're not really. We're we're we're, uh, we're stretching DAGs here and there for Exchange, but we're using application layer or 
software solutions from various vendors to achieve that. And VMware is not playing a role there yet. Not they, are. they 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 could play a role there, yeah. but again, my, I I hesitate and I balk at the price tag. They they can. So that's a barrier for you. Sure. That's a yeah, that's a use those higher level licenses to sure. get some of that features. Sure. Yeah, sure. Good business. <laughs> yeah. Pat Kelsinger has a good future, I predict. Uh, <laughs> I think got a loyal customer base, you know, and that's like Vinod Kosla said today. Most IT practitioners, you're a, you're a rare breed, Bob. Most IT practitioners aren't going to take risks, right? They're going to yeah. do what doesn't get them fired. You are of, of a mindset of, hey, it gives us competitive advantage, I'm going to go there. That's what yeah. I'm, I'm sensing from you. Yeah, here. yeah, well, I get that support from my executive team. You know, the innovation yeah. is one of the things that they impress upon me, and they make it a requirement of my daily job. I look at Nutanix as one of those opportunities yeah. to innovate. And you're from Boston, so you're ballsy. So, hey, Bob, thanks very much for coming <laughs> on theCUBE. Thank you, really it's great to it. meet you guys. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back with our next guest right after this, we're at .next in Miami. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back.